All right, welcome. So, this is the first now of four lectures. These will be the four lectures on Christianity. The four lectures, um, remember, basically we're going to pick up with the end of the uh, Old Testament uh, discussion week. And um, uh, a few things. First of all, I'm wearing a... Uh, reddish shirt. This actually is my burgundy shirt that I also wore for uh, Buddhism. Uh, if there's a color of Christianity, it's red. Red, the, uh, uh, the bishops and the uh, uh, wear red, the, the, uh, the most uh, decorative of the uh, Vestments uh, in the Catholic Church are red. The uh, uh, door on an Episcopal Church is always red. We have the blood of Christ, and uh, and so red is the color. And I don't have a really red shirt, so this is uh, what I'm what I'm wearing here for the start of Christianity. Um, this is uh, I want to say two things before we even get started here. Um, Many of you have been raised in a Christian household. Many of you know these stories. I, I want to remind you of two metaphors. Two metaphors that we began this class with. The first was a, the metaphor of the blind men and the elephant. That was a story of blind men exploring an elephant and reporting what an elephant is like, and each one had a different understanding of the elephant, depending on what part of it they had explored. And we learned from that parable that, A, we, we draw conclusions from limited evidence, and B, sometimes we select the evidence that supports our, our expectations in the first place. And so that parable is relevant. Uh, Christianity is going to be a big elephant, and many of you are familiar with certain parts or the way in which it was presented to you, and you're going to find out that there is more to the elephant than perhaps you realized. The other metaphor was the magic trick. Interesting thing about magic tricks. Magic tricks, uh, the younger you are, the more amazing they are. They're amazing. And young children think you're a real magician. Uh, and they, they have no idea how, the, how you did it, and they just, they just live in their amazement. And as we get older, we really want to know. We think, we, we realize there's more going on than meets the eye. That was one of the teachings of the magic trick. And, uh, and so we want to know how the magician did it. Uh, and, and here's the deal. When we find out, it kind of diminishes that amazement. It diminishes that wonder. It, uh, it, it uh, oh, it was just a trick. Uh, oh, that's how easy it was. And the danger here as we turn to Christianity, the danger here is that Christianity is not really about facts. You are going to encounter numerous contradictions within Christianity. The power and strength of Christianity is not found in truth, in the sense that it can be proven. The power of Christianity is found in emotion. It's found in your experience of Jesus Christ, not your knowledge or uh, opinion of who he was. It's a very experiential. The, Christianity has won. You, we, we did the village of a hundred people. Christianity is the number one religion on this planet. 
and it, it and it is number one because of the emotion it arouses. Remember that midbrain when I took the brain apart? That midbrain of emotion and memory. This this is what is captured in Christianity, not the cerebral cortex, not the rationality. On some level, some of it needs to be suspended. So this is a bit of a disclaimer as we begin Christianity. I, I, it's, I've run the risk. It's uh, You're going to learn things about Christianity you may not have realized. And you will encounter some of its contradictions because this is an academic class about belief, about what it's based on. We're looking at it very academically. Do not forget, I do not want to be responsible for diminishing any of your experience of the religion you're choosing to follow. Just know that up front. It, it scares me. It, uh, it humbles me. I, I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news or, uh, uh, or break the magical feelings that some of you may have. So I say all of that, uh, but I need to present Christianity. So this is going to be the first of four lectures. Uh, today we're going to look at the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, the next lecture will be on Paul and what happens in effect after Jesus' life. Uh, the third lecture we will look at uh, the development of Christianity. And the fourth lecture we will look at Christianity today. So that's the basic outline. Let's dig in. I want to go back to the timeline. And now we're going to blow up a few, uh, a few dates here as we dive in. Uh, what we have here is, uh, let's start with uh, uh, 4 BC, which doesn't make a lot of sense. I know we talked about that a little bit. And we have Jesus' Jesus's birth. Jesus' birth in 4 BC. We'll talk about the stories in a moment. Um, what we have is very little about his, uh, his early life. Uh, we move to anywhere, and now the, it's, it's, a, it's a range. It starts somewhere between 26 and 28 AD. We have showing up on the scene, and this is the beginning of, uh, of a number of the narratives anyway, is John the Baptist. John the Baptist seems to uh, uh, precede Jesus. And uh, John is uh, preaching, preaching in Galilee, preaching, uh, uh, he is uh, bringing people baptism and uh, the washing away of their sins. Uh, this is John the Baptist ushering in a new day, the, the reign of the kingdom of, of God. Um, and Jesus shows up and is b baptized by John. That's his, uh, a big part of the story. Uh, and so Jesus shows up, uh, and what we usually say is uh, from 28 to 30, we have Jesus' preaching, uh, his ministry, the ministry of Jesus, beginning sometime between 28 and 30, and it runs, so these are beginning dates, so to speak, and it runs in approximately, uh, we're going to say, if it's the 30 to 33 A.D. is the crucifixion. So this is not how long the ministry, this is when they, be, they began. Uh, ministry basically runs for a couple of years, uh, uh, 
uh, it follows his uh, his meeting with John the Baptist, his his baptism. What's going to happen after the crucifixion? Uh, more detail of which we'll get in the next lecture. Uh, we have showing up in about 37. These are all AD now, or CE. Uh, in 37, we have uh, Paul. Paul is actually Saul. His name will change to Paul. Paul's conversion. Details tomorrow, or the next lecture. Um, Paul shows up in 37. What we've got is uh, uh, he writes letters from between 48 and 56. We have the letters, the letters of Paul. And... Uh, and then we have uh, a couple of things happen. 62 A.D., um, you'll understand this better, uh, Jesus' brother James. James has basically succeeded Jesus in this little sect of uh, Christianity that is built, that is, that is beginning. It's called the Jerusalem Assembly within Judaism. So we have Jesus' brother James has been in charge of the Jerusalem assembly. Uh, James dies. He's actually put to death in 62. And in 66, we have the death execution of... Peter and Paul in Rome. And from then you know that uh, in 70 we have the destruction of the temple. That will play in. Since before that Christianity is really buried within the Judaism of the time. Uh, in the early 70s, we'll just put it 71, we have the first gospel. We have the gospel of Mark. I realize that the order in your, in your Bible goes Matthew, Mark, uh, Actually, the historical order is reversed. Mark was written first. Uh, uh, Matthew and Luke come along in about uh, 80. Sometimes it's usually put between 80 and 85. We have the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. And... Uh, somewhere between 100 and 120, we get uh, the Gospel of John. The four stories, the four narratives, the four Gospels. Uh, this is your basic timeline. We may refer back to it. Uh, uh, well, certainly today our, our goal is basically to get to here. Um, but I need to talk first about this issue of the Gospels. We know about this part because we have four stories. We have what are called the Gospels. Hopefully you took your notes on that. Um, but you can always pause. Gospel. What is a gospel? Gospel is, is interesting. Uh, we have actually, it's, it's funny how we've kind of uh, co-opted this word into literally truth. We say, oh, it's the gospel truth, or uh, uh, I swear, it's the gospel. Uh, and we've kind of created that, uh, we've transformed that uh, word into a word virtually synonymous with truth. Gospel does not mean truth. 
In fact, actually far from it. Gospel, which comes from a Greek word, uh, uh, which basically translates as good news, was a literary form at, this, at the time of Jesus, and actually what a gospel really was, was my word for it, it was a promotion. More or less an advertisement. It was, gospels were written primarily about emperors. There would be the gospel of Julius Caesar. Now, it was basically a literary form that uh, bragged about his achievements. It, uh, it listed his achievements, and everyone basically understood, just like we understand advertisements on television, that, that it was potentially exaggerated, that it was written for a reason. It was written to sell us on how great this emperor was. And so it's, it's interesting to understand in historical context that these are not stories that are really history. They were never really meant to be history. History was not even a well-recognized literary form. Uh, we have some information about it. A man by the name of Josephus wrote uh, a number of, uh, uh, of literally historical works at the time, and they have survived, and that is a big part of our ability to connect some of these dots. We, we, we add archaeology, we, we have the writings of Josephus, and we have the Gospels themselves. And so we, we have a, an ability to compare notes, so to speak. So uh, uh, we have these four Gospels, these four promotions of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, uh, they're full of contradictions. I, I want to say this about the Gospels to, to begin with. Uh, it's an interesting exercise, if you're ever really curious about this, to put the four, instead of reading through a gospel, and then reading through another gospel, is to read them side by side. If we start, for example, with this issue of the birth narrative. So, Jesus' birth, here's a perfect example of how the four gospels do not agree. We think, we know, we have a birth story that we, that we illustrate and sometimes dramatize on the church lawn, uh, even used to be the town square, but some, most towns have uh, outlawed that uh, uh, because of the separation of church and state. But um, we really have four birth narratives and they are different in all four Gospels. So we start out in Mark, for example. In Mark, uh, Jesus is from Nazareth. There is no virgin birth in Mark. There is no Bethlehem. Mark starts out, actually, um, uh, he, he just begins with uh, Jesus uh, coming out, coming from Nazareth and being baptized by John the Baptist. No Bethlehem. Now, what's the, what's the importance of Bethlehem as we turn to the next two? As we turn to the next two, there's going to be an issue. It's going to be a big issue in Christianity. This turns out to be a, uh, an issue between Christianity and Judaism. And the issue has to do with the Messiah. 
the Messiah. Uh, Messiah, Messiah, so that we understand Messiah uh, uh, as a word, uh, it comes from the, the Hebrew word is machia, uh, which gets translated into Greek. Uh, I should talk about this for a moment. Uh, know this, the Gospels, the New Testament is written in Greek. It's not written in Hebrew, not written in Latin. It was written in Greek. All the Gospel writers wrote in Greek. Greek was the dominant language of the Roman Empire. Greek, when Alexander the Great from Greece, back in 350 uh, BC, conquers Persia, he, that, that, that Greek Empire runs from Greece all the way through the, uh, out to Asia, through northern Africa. Alexander the Great conquered the whole Middle East and brought called the Hellenistic uh, uh, time period, uh, and it was dominated by Greek architecture, Greek uh, culture, and the Greek language. Greek was the primary language spoken, the, the, the unifying language. There were obviously the dialects. It was uh, Hebrew and Aramaic and uh, uh, Aramaic being a slang version of uh, Hebrew and Arabic. Uh, we, we assume actually that Jesus uh, uh, taught and spoke in, uh, in uh, Aramaic. Uh, the word Messiah translated into Greek becomes Christos. Uh, oh. What does Messiah mean? What does Machia mean? It means anointed one. The anointed one. Anointed by God. Chosen by God. Important to understand. A human being. Chosen by God. Uh, the Messiah the Hebrew, Machia, goes to Christos in Greek, which will ultimately go to Christ in English. This is, this is what it means. It means anointed one. It's a title. Uh, uh, ultimately, we will talk a little bit about this with Paul, is this issue of, uh, is it Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus? Uh, uh, this He's the anointed one. Uh, the model for a Messiah, Jews are still waiting for a Messiah, because the model is King David. King David. What does King David do? King David, back in 1000 BC, unites the 12 tribes, uh, unites the entire region under Judaism, lays the plans for the first temple, which his son Solomon will build, uh, uh, ushers in a period of peace and prosperity. This is the model for a Messiah. King David is the model. When we have this issue of, of uh, whether or not Jesus is the Messiah, uh, one of the ways we have two prophecies uh, one is the uh, uh, one is the uh, uh, prophet uh, Hosea. Hosea says that the next Messiah will come from Egypt. The prophet Micah, prophets in the Old Testament, says that the next Messiah will come from the family of David, a descendant of King David. These are the two prophecies that, uh, that people knew at the time. And so, as we turn now to the issue of 
Matthew, what we have is two contradictory stories within Matthew even. Matthew begins in chapter 1 with a, with a list of a lineage of who the father and the son and basically it begins with David and it, who does it end with? It ends with Joseph. Joseph, I don't want to say Jesus' father, uh, Joseph, the husband of Mary. Joseph is from Bethlehem. Joseph is a descendant from the house of David, which is really interesting that that Matthew goes to the trouble of laying out the lineage to Joseph, in effect creating uh, legitimacy for considering Jesus the Messiah. Uh, and then he switches. Because, in a sense, the, the story is going to be that Joseph really isn't the father of Jesus. And so Matthew, after going to the trouble of laying out that whole lineage, uh, literally starts with uh, Abraham uh, and gets all the way to Joseph. Uh, he then changes the story completely. Joseph and Mary are living in Bethlehem because Joseph is from Bethlehem. So there's no census, there's no manger scene in Matthew. There is... Uh, Joseph and Mary living in Bethlehem. And there is a prophecy, an astrological prophecy, that Herod, King Herod, knows about. And that prophecy is that a child will be born in Bethlehem and overthrow Rome. And so he sends three ministers three ministers to Bethlehem to see if he, they, they can find this child. And so the three, these are the basically the wise men. Um, they uh, follow the star to the uh, uh, household, to the, to the, uh, uh, the birth of, uh, uh, of Jesus, and they're so taken aback um, that they, they do not return to Herod with the news. I mean, they're overwhelmed by this, this uh, amazing birth. And so um, uh, they warn Joseph and Mary that Herod is basically after their son. They should go to Egypt. And so uh, Joseph and Mary take... Uh, 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 the baby Jesus, and they flee to Egypt. Now, uh, there is the story that they are not betrothed at the time that Mary gets pregnant, and God visits Joseph and explains that uh, uh, he is to honor this birth, he's not to take this personally, that uh, uh, this is the work of God, and that, uh, and so Joseph, uh, after this dream, uh, goes along with the, uh, uh, or this vision, goes along with this and does not, in Matthew's words, know Mary, uh, that euphemism for uh, sleep with Mary. Uh, he did not know Mary till after the birth of Jesus. And this is a uh, line, this will become controversial in Catholicism. We'll get to that at some point. Um, so Matthew has uh, Jesus born in Bethlehem, and they flee to uh, Egypt. The wise men never return to Herod. Herod is really upset. And in Matthew, Herod orders the slaying of all children uh, under the age of two in Bethlehem. Now, and then what happens is after Herod's death, Joseph and Mary with Jesus 
come out of Egypt, fulfilling Hosea's prophecy that, uh, that uh, the Messiah will come out of Egypt and uh, they settle in Nazareth. So these are the two stories, the two different, in effect, stories of the birth in Matthew. Luke is the story most of you know. Luke, Luke comes up with the census, the census that, uh, Math, that uh, Joseph and Mary are living in Nazareth. Uh, we'll talk about Nazareth in a moment. Uh, they're living in Nazareth, and, uh, but Joseph is from Bethlehem. And Rome has ordered a census be taken, and everyone is to return to the, to the land of their birth and to be counted and to have their taxes paid. And uh, uh, look, I, I guess I have to inject at this point that from a historical basis, um, this is, uh, is uncorroborated. Uh, we have a lot of records. We have a lot of Roman records. Uh, a, there was no massacre of, uh, of uh, Jewish babies in Bethlehem. There is absolutely no record of that whatsoever to support uh, Matthew's claim. Uh, there is no... Rome was far more efficient than to have everyone travel, everyone all over the country, stop the economy, like we're doing right now, stop the economy and have everyone return to their birthplace, wait to be counted, and and how are they to pay their taxes anyway? Because if most people are farmers, um, they can't bring their their wealth, their goats, or their sheep, or whatever they're going to contribute in terms of their tribute to Rome. It 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 from a practical standpoint does not fit with the facts. But this is what Luke comes up with. Remember what gospel means. Uh, uh, facts, facts are not overly important in that traditional literary uh, structure. So Luke comes up with the census. And so Mary and Joseph have to travel from uh, uh, Nazareth back to Bethlehem. There is no room in the inn, so they end up in a manger. Uh, the three wise men are three shepherds. Uh, there's no, there's no, um, uh, they're told by an angel. There's no real star. They're not really following a star. They're told by an angel of the birth in the city of David. Um, and, uh, and so, Jesus is born to a virgin mother uh, in Bethlehem, uh, in the manger, and, uh, and Luke goes to the trouble of explaining that uh, he was circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, the ritual of circumcision was, uh, took place, and after they, uh, oh, uh, uh, Joseph goes to the temple in Jerusalem, uh, and makes his uh, sacrifice of gratitude. He sacrifices two turtle doves uh, at the uh, at the temple uh, in appreciation of the safe birth of uh, of uh, the baby Jesus. And um, they return to Nazareth. Uh, and finally, we have John. And John like Mark, actually says nothing about the birth in Bethlehem. Uh, one of the things that happens, and we need to understand, especially since this is the order of writing them, the, order, the older the gospel, the more human Jesus is. Uh, as the gospels proceed through that timeline, Jesus becomes more and more magical. By the time we get to John, it's simply Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, 
they will all refer to him, once they get the birth story out of the way, they will all refer to him as Jesus of Nazareth. He is never referred to as Jesus of Bethlehem, uh, uh, other than in the first basic chapter or two of any of these uh, of these Gospels. Um, uh, for, for John, Jesus is already God. Jesus is... is uh, uh, the Son of God, Jesus, the, the, the details of the birth story are not important for John. Jesus is the Son of God, period, beginning and end, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, there's even a, a, a place in John where, uh, uh, no, I don't have it right here, but uh, where he's, uh, Jesus is asked, uh, uh, where he's from, and, and it's it's John is really clear when he says Jesus is from Nazareth. Um, four different birth stories, uh, four different narratives. Really, what they all have in common are two things. They're going to basically turn very quickly to uh, his baptism by John the Baptist and the beginning of his teachings. The, the Gospels uh, take place in basically two places. Uh, the first half of each narrative is, uh, uh, birth story aside, is, takes place in Galilee. We have his teachings his teachings. Now, Jesus has a message. Jesus has a message. It is a message of good news. Uh, it is very clear in Mark 1.15. It is probably stated the most clearly. Uh, uh, the reign of God is near. Repent and believe in the good news. This was his message. Uh, we need to get ready for the, the, the kingdom of God, which is about to descend on earth. Uh, what does it mean to get ready? It means to repent, to, uh, uh, to live without limits, to love as God loves, to, uh, uh, with perfect generosity, and to join the family of God. This is the message throughout. It is a message that uh, the righteous will be elevated and the corrupt elite will meet their just due. This was really good news. We're talking, he is preaching to peasants. He is preaching to subsistence farmers in the Galilee. He is preaching to people under the yoke of Rome and under the yoke of a corrupt Jewish priesthood running the temple. Uh, uh, they see them in cahoots with uh, uh, Roman authorities. And Jesus is bringing them this news that the poor will be become first, that... Uh, the meek shall inherit the earth, that, uh, uh, that righteousness will prevail. Really powerful message. And it's reinforced. It's reinforced, so we have the teachings. And I know some of this is uh, 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 redundant for some of you who know, who, who know your Gospels, uh, uh, but understand, too, that I'm teaching for those that uh, may or may not be familiar with any of these. Uh, so we've got these, uh, 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 the teachings, the teachings, one, that uh, uh, the kingdom of God is near. Is near. That... Uh, uh, the righteous will be elevated. And 
the corrupt brought down. This is the good news. Prepare by loving as God loves. Prepare with generosity. Prepare to become a member of the family of God. And these are reinforced by uh, the reinforced by the miracles. All the gospels have the miracles in common. The miracles, uh, uh, turning uh, 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 water into wine, walking on water. We've got uh, all of these miracles. Uh, uh, the raising of the dead, the healing of the sick, the uh, 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 water into wine. We've got one story after another. All for the purpose of what? For the purpose of explaining this is no ordinary man. He is not, he is no ordinary man. The, the miracles emphasize it. The miracles they may not share the same birth story, but they share the miracles. The miracles and the parables. A lot of the teachings taught through parables. Parables. Parables like the parable of the Good Samaritan. What, what is that story? This is one of the famous stories of, uh, of Jesus that uh, uh, understand what a Samaritan is. A Samaritan is an outcast. Uh, at the time of Jesus, there were a number of groups, a number of groups. This is, uh, uh, this is a good, back good background, actually. There were uh, the groups that were uh, at work, so to speak. We had the Sadducees. Uh, let me actually just uh, teach you this. Uh, these were the, the breakdown of society at the, society at the time. We have the Sadducees. God knows how it's spelled. Uh, the Sadducees were, uh, I'm going to give you some uh, bad analogies, but uh, 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 they're like the Republicans. The Republicans. These are, these are the elite. These are the uh, privileged. This is the upper class, so to speak. Uh, uh, the Sadducees. We have the Pharisees. The Pharisees are like the Democrats. <laughs> oh, don't quote me on this. Uh, they're the do-gooders. They're do-gooders. But in... As far as Jesus is concerned, they're hypocrites. They're hypocrites. Uh, uh, because they talk a good show, but they really don't follow through. Uh, uh, these are the Pharisees. We have uh, a, a, the, sad, the uh, Samaritans. The Samaritans are... The outcasts, the outcasts, they're the poor, they're the, they're the, uh, uh, the servants, they're the outcasts, the Samaritans, uh, and that will explain the parable in a moment when I get back to it. The Samaritans, we've got uh, Essenes, the Essenes are the hippies, these are the dropouts. The Essenes are who go to the desert, and uh, that's, this is where we, we have the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, uh, the Essenes uh, 
are, they're really getting ready for the kingdom of God. They uh, renounce possessions, they go to the desert, they live communally uh, off the land, they uh, uh, reject all materialism completely, and there's one problem the Messines have, and that is that they don't believe in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, offspring, they, they, they believe in celibacy, uh, uh, no sex for the Essenes. This is not a way to survive as a, as a group. Uh, this, is, <laughs> uh, this is not, uh, survival is not uh, uh, assured for a group that uh, insists on celibacy. So uh, the Essenes will ultimately drop out. There is a group called the Zealots. The zealots are the revolutionaries. The zealots are the ones they they're uh, they're bent on overthrowing Rome. They are uh, on some level they can be dangerous to the uh, uh, the high priesthood as well. They're. Uh, uh, cloak and dagger kind of people they're 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 really sowing revolt and uh and this will become a revolt in 66 uh it is the 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 widespread revolt that brings rome down on them and the destruction of the temple in 70 to begin with and there's a secondary revolt in 135 these led by the zealots the zealots there is a theory there's a book uh, i highly recommend it uh, a book called The Zealot. It is a book that looks at Jesus' life as if he was a member of this group. And it's really well researched. It's a, uh, uh, I found it a compelling read as well. It was a bestseller, a book called The Zealot. Uh, uh, this is pretty much a, a, a glimpse of what the, the background is when Jesus is preaching. And so Jesus uh, tells a story. Now that we understand it, we under that uh, what has happened is that a uh, uh, a traveler, uh, uh, businessman, so to speak, uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, robbed and mugged and uh, attacked and left by the side of the road, and he's disheveled and he's uh, he's totally uh, 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 injured. And what happens? Uh, a Pharisee walks on by. Uh, uh, a Pharisee, the do-gooders. Uh, he's really illustrating how the Pharisees are hypocrites. Uh, neither the Pharisees nor the Sadducees, no one helps him. Who helps him? A Samaritan. A Samaritan. One of the outcasts. Someone, this is the classic case of the wealthy in our society, don't give as much charity as the poor give to, the, to, to, to other poor, especially as a percentage of, uh, of income. Uh, uh, the Samaritan helps them. The Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this is an illustration of how the poor will be elevated and the corrupt elite will be brought down. Uh, the parable, one of the ways in which Jesus taught. So uh, we have his teachings. We have the miracles, and then what happens is the story moves to the second part. The second part in each narrative is when uh, Jesus goes to Jerusalem. Now, understand his message. Understand that uh, he is a thorn in the side of both the Jewish uh, uh, authorities and Rome. He is preaching, uh, if not sedition, he is preaching uh, uh, the overturning of the status quo. And uh, if he is to confront the powers that be, 
he's going to have to go to Jerusalem. And there's a uh, scene in which he rides on a donkey and there are uh, palm leaves and uh, uh, this is a, uh, uh, an illusion, a vision of uh, him, uh, the Messiah entering Jerusalem. Uh, remember that, uh, uh, that prediction by uh, Hosea that he will come out of, uh, out of Egypt riding a donkey with palm. This, this is that whole uh, description from uh, the Old Testament. And so it is acted out as he enters Jerusalem. And we have what we call the Passion Story. Uh, that it it moves, he confronts the Jewish authorities. The big story in that is the temple, the what is called the money lenders in the temple. Now the temple, which I've tried to describe to you, is both it's not just a religious structure. Uh, it, yes, it is a religious structure, but it is the center of the economy. It is the political center. It is, it is many centers. Uh, everything is centralized in the temple. So, uh, and you have these outer chambers, and, and if people are coming to make sacrifice, they're going to have to, uh, if they haven't brought a sheep or a lamb or turtle doves to sacrifice, they're going to have to be purchased. Uh, people are coming from all over the country. There are different currencies. Uh, and so we have money changers, just like if you go to a foreign country, you'll have a, 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 a foreign exchange uh, office. Uh, uh, same thing is happening there. Uh, Basically, you have stalls outside the temple. Uh, you have sacrifices taking place. And with each inner courtyard, you get closer and closer to the Holy of Holies in the innermost courtyard, which is only accessible by the high priest. So uh, uh, this is the temple. And Jesus is uh, uh, revolted by it. Uh, Jesus sees what's going on, sees the money changers, sees the, uh, 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 the, the uh, economy and the, uh, uh, the market of sacrifices, and it abhors him. And so there is a scene where he overturns their tables and... Uh, um, it's a very provocative scene uh, to understand. Uh, again, gospel tends to mean exaggeration. Uh, if uh, that had really happened, he would have been arrested on the spot. Uh, this was uh, 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 the fact that he gets away with it at all is uh, is really interesting. Um, but it illustrates it illustrates the point. He is there to confront. The establishment. He is there to usher in change. He's a change agent. And this does not sit well with either Roman authorities or uh, uh, Jewish authorities. And so we have uh, a number of scenes. We have the Last Supper, which uh, is an allusion to the Passover Seder, which we've discussed in uh, in Judaism, and when we get to the holidays and Christianity, uh, we will talk about the connection between Easter and uh, and Passover, and uh, and clearly this Last Supper is his Passover Seder with his uh, his apostles. I didn't even go into the apostles. I forgot about them. He's collected uh, these disciples uh, along the way in Galilee. Um, and uh, they have come with him to Jerusalem. And one of those disciples, Judas Iscariot. Judas, um, there are different portrayals of Judas. Uh, one that he's just an outright traitor. Um, uh, the other that, that Judas was, uh, there's a take that Ju Ju Judas was doing it for Jesus' own good. That... Uh, uh, it's a minority take. This is kind of like having different versions of the Ramayana. Um, uh, but uh, uh, Judas uh, 
one of his apostles, one of his disciples, uh, betrays, lets Roman, the Roman authorities know where Jesus is. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, uh, the soldiers come. They, uh, they take Jesus and uh, uh, they, they torture him. They put a crown of thorns on him. Um, interesting sidelight here, this whole issue of uh, is he the Messiah? He is accused of it. He's accused of being the Son of God. Uh, throughout the Gospels, there's this cryptic message that he's the Son of Man, whatever that means. Uh, there is a... Um, and for the most part, Jesus avoids claiming that status. Uh, it's always put in the in the mouth of uh, a Roman centurion or uh, uh, someone describing him as the king of the Jews. And uh, uh, on some level, Jesus denies it. But uh, this is what he's accused of. Uh, He's accused of sedition against Rome, and he is brought before Pilate. And uh, I had read you that Matthew seven twenty seven. Um, uh, Pilate washes his hands of him, and uh, he is uh, ultimately crucified. Uh, it's a horror. It's a horrendous death. It is. Uh, it was at the time a. Uh, uh, a marker by Rome. Look, Rome wasn't taking troublemakers uh, lightly, and crucifixion did two things. Not only did it punish, it it advertised. It uh, made sure that everyone knew that that's the fate you would be met with if you mess with Rome. And so crucifixion was... Uh, uh, a spectacle. It was a lesson given to the uh, uh, to everyone, uh, like a public hanging. This was uh, and 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 the suffering on the cross was meant to last, uh, to draw out that message, and um, and so then we have the uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, his final words, turning to God, saying, "Why hast thou forsaken me?" and um, and his death on the cross. Uh, it takes place on a Friday. This is very interesting as it relates to Judaism, because Friday at sundown becomes the Sabbath. You cannot be buried on the Sabbath. There is a, a, a clear uh, rush because he dies on. Friday afternoon, and the idea is to get them. Remember, in uh, in Judaism, the uh, uh, the morning ritual is that the funeral takes place right away, and so there is a funeral. A uh, uh, back then, the the dead were buried in basically cave uh, cave like structures. Uh, uh, usually owned by wealthier people, um, and so there is a uh, a follower that uh, provides uh, the, the the cave, and uh, Jesus is taken down from the cross and rushed uh, to the cave before sunset. Um, this is he's he's uh, he was crucified on a Friday. This will become Good Friday. Um, and then he rises on the third day. Friday is counted as the first day, Saturday the second day, and Sunday becomes the third day. And so just when you think the story has ended, the, this is like a, uh, a thriller where you think that someone has, has just died and then his eyes open and what happens, they come back on Sunday after the Sabbath and lo and behold, the rock has been moved, the tomb is empty and, um, uh, and Jesus appears. This becomes now the story of the risen Christ and uh, that's where we'll pick up in, in, in the next lecture. So uh, I've made it through to 30 AD, 30 to 33, whenever the 
crucifixion takes place. Um, uh, these, this is also basically where the Gospels leave off. Uh, a few of them do relate an element of the uh, of the risen Jesus, uh, the risen Christ. Uh, I'll touch base. We'll start there, uh, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Uh, because uh, just a hint. Uh, same story again. No major successor. Uh, Opinions will flourish. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, not, Jesus left no writings. He left no orders. He. It's it, it, most scholars believe that Jesus was illiterate. He left no. No uh, organized uh, written orders, teachings, anything. It is for the story that is there where we'll pick up the story. Um, I know that that was not a, uh, A reverential treatment. I, I clearly did not take one story and, and elevate it. Uh, and, and again, as I started this lecture, do not let the facts interfere with your, with your experience, with your understanding, with the Jesus Christ that you've grown up with. That's the important one for you. I apologize if uh, anything I have said today, if um, if the, if it if it came across as uh, skeptical or irreverent, um, I deeply apologize. Uh, it's a story of magic. It's a story difficult to corroborate. It's a story for each individual follower to interpret themselves. This is where Jesus leaves it with you. This is for you to decide. This is why Christianity is more emotional than intellectual. Stay safe. Keep your family safe. Uh, we will pick up the story with, uh, uh, we'll begin with the crucifixion and the uh, limited uh, versions in the Gospels, and we'll move to Acts where the story continues. Have a great day. Until the next lecture. <laughs>